Praise band. The Lord be with you. We have uh, announcements today, but I, before I begin, I would like to call up uh, Miss Holly Bray to come forth from the call committee and update you on the progress of their work. Good morning. I'm Holly Bray, a member of the call committee. Um, hopefully you've seen the survey, which uh, is in the Eagle this week. You can also retrieve one from the Welcome Center if you need to. This is the first week of the distribution of the survey, but we plan to have it available in the uh, bulletin in the Eagle for a few weeks, and it will continue to remain at the Welcome Center as well to make sure that uh, everyone has an opportunity to get one and fill it out. If they weren't at church this week, it'll be available over the next few coming weekends as well. But with that in mind, please make sure that uh, you fill out just one per person, if you would, even as you continue to see it in the bulletin. If you fill it out and you drop it off in the box, you're done. <laughs> so just one per person, please. The goal of the survey is to help the call committee, uh, you know, just get a feel for what the congregation is thinking, uh, what are the needs uh, going forward, and what the call committee should consider doing. We would ask that you pray for guidance and uh, reflect on the questions before filling it out. If you read the instructions at the top of the uh, survey paper, you'll see that it says that there as well. Um, the survey box is located right next to the Welcome Center. That's there today, and it's going to remain there until September 17th. So you have almost a whole month to think about the survey, to fill it out, and to contemplate the questions and uh, uh, think about it before turning it in. So please uh, make sure you do pray about it before you fill it out and turn it in. Um, you have some time, you can take it home if you would like to, or uh, if you do fill it out here at church, you can find a quiet corner somewhere to uh, sit down by yourself and pray for a few moments, that's fine. But just please don't forget to do that important step before filling it out. If you have any questions, you can direct them to myself or any other member of the call committee. Thank you. Thank you, Holly.
In other announcements uh, for uh, this uh, weekend, uh, we need uh, more people to sign up for LifeLight and uh, home fires. We only have two for each. And uh, in order to make a class out of uh, both events, uh, it would be nice to have a goodly amount of people participating. Also, the golf outing is the 16th of September. It's coming, uh, it's approaching us fast. Uh, time to get uh, the, the forms in for those that are golfing. And also, if you are wanting to help out in any way, uh, you are asked to do so, to participate. Also, in our service today, we'll be giving out Bibles to third graders and their parents after the offering. We begin with the singing of our opening hymn, our opening song.
rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord is good. Worthy is his name. From through him and for him are all things. Lord of the heavens and of the earth, your riches and wisdom abound. Who has a mind like yours? No one is comparable to you. You are higher than the highest mountain. You are deeper than the depths of the ocean. Your love knows no bounds, and yet your love, you love us lowly beings. You call us the apple of your eye. We pray, Heavenly Father, we confess that we are lazy in our faith. We tire of waiting, losing focus on your promises, and doubting the plans you have for us. We are quick to judge and hold pride in our hearts. In all that we do, stir us on your path of righteousness. Even in our sin, you loved us and even died for us, raising from the dead and overcoming sin's curse of death. Please be seated. Our Old Testament lesson for our weekend is from Isaiah chapter 56. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come and my righteousness be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it, and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle lesson is from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, the 11th chapter, selected verses. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, do you not know that what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Now am I speaking to you Gentiles? Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For in their rejection if for if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now I have received mercy because of their disobedience. So they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may receive, now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. This is the word of the Lord. We stand for the hearing of the Holy Gospel. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 15th chapter. This also will serve as the text for today's message. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. 
And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon, but he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and to throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the gospel of the Lord. We join in our affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for our sermon song.
Thank you, Holly. Praise man. Wonderful. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for today is taken from Matthew chapter 15. We bow our heads in a moment of prayer. Our good and gracious Father in heaven, we give you thanks for this day, especially as the beginning of Sunday school and especially going back to school and the lives of many of our youth. We pray, Heavenly Father, that today we would be students of your word as your word is proclaimed to us. May your spirit open our hearts and minds that we may truly grow in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, fellow redeemed in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, I want to ask you a question, what these people have in common. There is Alfred the Great of England, there's Catherine the Great of, of Russia, there's Henry the Great of France, Frederick the Great of Prussia, Alexander the Great, and Herod the Great. So what do they have in common? What? Great. And that is the right answer. They have the title great. Now, we can understand that title of great being given to Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the one who uh, rebuilt the uh, temple in Jerusalem. And uh, he, he uh, made aqueducts for water to be delivered to cities. And uh, he also made uh, fortifications and he was a great builder of many things. However, he had a dark side to himself. He was so scared about being toppled from being uh, king by his family that he had them all killed. And not only did he kill all of his family, he also gave the order to kill all the male babies in the city, the town of Bethlehem. So although he has got the title great, I wonder how many think he's great after you find out his dark side. Now, there are others who have never been given the title of that word great, but their actions certainly have led people to believe that they were great. They have given their lives to helping others, discovering new ways to treat illnesses, tirelessly giving of their time to the sick and the dying and to the poor. People like Mother Teresa, doctors, nurses. I think of South Africa, Nelson Mandela. All the things that these people did, but they never were given the title great. Now on a personal level, there may be people in your life that you believe have been great or are great. They may not have achieved fame on a world scale, but as far as you are concerned, they are great people in your life. They are the special people in your lives, people whom you've come to love and to respect because of their gentleness, because of their goodness toward us. People who have done something or said something to help us in some way, changed us for the better, people who will always be a part of us even if we should move or die. Their names will be in our hearts and minds as long as we live. Today, we hear Jesus in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew talking about the greatness of a Canaanite woman when he says, you are a woman of great faith. Jesus never says this about his disciples. More often than not, he says of them, you of little faith. Last week we heard about Peter, who wanted to get out of the boat and walk on the wind and the waves on the, on the lake and go to Jesus. And when he took his eyes off of Jesus, he began to sink like a rock. And it was only then when he cried out to Jesus, Jesus gives him his arm and helps him up and saves him from a watery death. 
on only one other occasion, and this I'm going to ask you a question and see if you get the answer. On one other occasion, Jesus praised the person for having great faith. No, it's not one of the disciples. It's uh, someone that's not even an Israelite. Matter of fact, it's someone who is a foreigner like this Canaanite woman. Can you name who that person is? Huh? Someone said it. Who said it? Oh, they, thank you, Howard. The centurion, the Roman centurion. He was a foreigner. And those are the only two in the New Testament that Jesus talks about having great faith. Now this kind of greatness may not bring any fame or fortune in the world, but it is something that certainly you and I would like to be called as followers of Christ. Wouldn't you like to be called a person of great faith? Or maybe you would like the title of maybe just having a little more faith than you currently have right now. And when you stop and think about it, if we were people of great faith, that would have an impact on us in what's happening in our lives. It would help us enormously with the problems that you and I face. When we deal with our stresses and fears and trials, it would give us peace and it would give us calmness. We could live life with confidence because our faith in God is that he will provide for us and that he will only give us that which is for our good. You see, we could let go of our anxieties. We could let go of, of all of the things that beset us in life. And we could start each new day, each new day with a joyful kind of freedom. Because our trust is in God alone. For Jesus says to us, you are a person of great faith. Or even a person of just a little more faith, you and I would be helped. So let's ask ourselves the question, what was the secret of this Canaanite woman? What was it about her or about what she said or about what she did that made her so great in the eyes of Jesus? As we look at our text in Matthew 15, the answer becomes clear Nothing. There was nothing about this woman that even indicated that there was anything great about her. We don't even know her name. The Bible doesn't tell us. She had nothing, and culturally and religiously speaking, she was nothing. She was a Canaanite and not a Jew. She was unclean, she was a woman, and she was a noisy, irritating pest according to the disciples that day, as she was pestering to talk to Jesus. She had no right to ask anything of Jesus. She had no basis for having her cry for help heard. She had no right even to approach a Jewish rabbi. Everyone wished that she would just go away, but she doesn't. The disciples even asked Jesus to send her away because she was embarrassing them with being noisy, calling out and begging for help for a demon-possessed daughter. She was a mother who was desperate, and she falls at Jesus' feet with three words, Lord, help me. One of the famous Renaissance paintings is a scene that shows a woman kneeling down before Jesus. And, and in that uh, painting, she is there kneeling and she's lifting up empty hands, asking Jesus, Lord, help me. Now, Jesus doesn't let that moment pass. He uses it as, as an, an education for his disciples, a teaching lesson, if you will, and his response to that woman may seem rather, rather brutal. He says to her, now come on, 
I am the Messiah sent to Israel. You can't expect me that I am going to help you. And then he adds, what I have to give is for the children of Israel. As a mother, you know that you don't take food from your children and give it to your dog. Your children come first. And for me, the people of Israel are my first priority. Now, you can just imagine the disciples under their breath were probably saying, Ha ha, we told you he wasn't going to listen to you. Go away. You have no standing to be with Jesus or to ask Jesus anything. Now that kind of explanation is not going to stop that persistent Canaanite woman. She knows that she's not worthy of Jesus' attention. She knows that she's embarrassing this group of Jews and causing even more scorn to fall on her head. But she is a mother who has a very real need. And Jesus is someone that can help her in that need. See, so she replies using Jesus' image of a dog eating the children's food. Yes, I know I'm a dog, but maybe even a dog like me can eat the crumbs that fall from your table. In other words, I need help so much that I'm prepared to be like a dog that waits for any leftovers that might be thrown my way. I'm nobody, I'm not important, but you can help me. I'm prepared to accept any insult that's going to come my way from your disciples. If there was a, such a thing as being more than empty, then this would describe that woman as she begged Jesus for help. And that's why Jesus said those words to her, that he never could say to his 12 disciples, you are a woman of great faith. What you want will be done for you. So what is the secret of great faith? Without a doubt, it is, it is an awareness of one's own utter emptiness. She knew that she wasn't even worthy of Jesus' attention and that she had no claim, nothing to bring, nothing uh, that would base uh, on a basis for her approval. She knew that she was a dog, that she was a beggar, kneeling in the dirt before her master. And it was at this point of being in the lowest place that she lifts up her empty hands to Jesus. Lord, help me. That's great faith. It's not a matter of being a hero or some kind of super believer being able to use God's name in every sentence that you speak or knowing volumes and volumes of theology. It is learning the fact that you are a beggar it's a matter of being aware that you have nothing to bring to God, nothing to say to God except those three words, Lord, help me. The last words that Martin Luther wrote the day before he died, he penned these words. He said, we are beggars, and that's the truth. What an odd way to sum up one's life, especially his life, this was a man who stood up to kings and councils, to papal decrees, challenged 16 centuries of tradition in the church. And more than that, he actually survived. He lived through it all. This was a man whose written work fills shelves upon shelves in seminaries, whose scholarly translation of the scriptures shaped the German language and whose courage reshaped the geography of Europe. This is a man who had rejected 
who redirected people back to the Bible and to the central truths, Christ alone, faith alone, grace alone, and scripture alone. Surely at the end of that life, there must have been time for boasting, a few moments for crowing. Yet like the apostle Paul, if he boasted, it was of his weakness. The emptiness of his hands as he begged for the Lord to fill them with grace and forgiveness in Christ. That's also our petition and position and our situation before God. We are in just the same place as that Canaanite woman and Luther and Paul. We are sinners, foreigners, specks of nothing before God. God owes us nothing. Not very popular to say that in our day, but it's true. He owes us nothing. If we fool ourselves for one moment that we have something over God, or we can have a claim over his favor, then we are lost. Our faith is then in ourselves and not in God alone. The kingdom of God, this picture of a beggar, is a profound one. We come to God with nothing. We realize that neither our mortality nor our religion count with God when it comes to righteousness. We come to him vulnerable and poor, or we don't come at all. That hymn writer says it well from years ago, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. We enter the waters of baptism as strangers and foreigners, aliens because of our sinfulness, we emerge washed and clean, and, and we are forgiven by the grace of God in Christ. And we become part of God's royal family. We are children of the King. We receive into our empty hands the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ with the wafer and the wine. And as we partake of it, we receive the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. We receive forgiveness that is ours in Christ alone. Our status as children is a gift from God and it gladdens every beggar's heart. Beggars we are and yet at the same time we are beloved children of God, children of our Heavenly Father because of what Jesus did on Good Friday with his suffering and death on the cross. We would want it no other way. And so like that Canaanite woman of great faith, may you also echo those three words when you approach God, Lord, Help me. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through faith unto Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Please take a moment and sign the worship card in your pew, identifying your attendance today. And we gather up our offering that the Lord's work may be done to the glory of his name.
seated. At this time, I would ask our third graders and their parents to come forward, please. Well, that's good. We're going to have a problem. Good morning. How are we doing? Must be a bad Sunday. No one's talking to me. Yeah. That's okay. Well, you know, you kids, when you were baptized, your sponsors and your parents agreed that as you grew, they would place in your hands the Bible. And today, those of you going into third grade get that wonderful gift of a Bible that hopefully you're going to read and use all the way through school, high school, because you're going to hear in that word as you study it the love that God has for you in Christ. And so I'm going to give your parents the Bible and they in turn will give it to their child. Okay? Sound like a plan? Okay. something that would be really neat for you parents to do uh, after lunch today is uh, write in that Bible a little, uh, uh, some of your thoughts for your child. Down the road, they will remember what you have had to say to them. It's a wonderful thing. Let's bow our heads in a short prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. We pray, Father, that we might always continue to walk with you, especially as you love and care for us each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may go back to your pew. Please rise. And today, when I end the petitions and I say, let us pray to the Lord, I'd like you to respond, Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for ourselves, the church around the world, and for all people in their various stations and conditions. For the church, calling sinners to repentance and proclaiming the gospel among people of every tribe and tongue, that clergy and lay leaders be faithful in their calling and protected under persecution, let us pray to the Lord. For the nations of the world, ordering society for peace and prosperity, that their leaders be just and compassionate, and that their citizens work together, harvesting and milling, teaching and learning, producing and providing, caring and conserving, to give glory to our gracious God and dignity to one another, let us pray to the Lord. For the downtrodden and the oppressed, the lonely and forgotten, the sick and the dying, and for those near and dear to us. Especially we pray for Bert Weber, Lois Holzgetter, Henry Felix, John Lohman, Doris Streming, Steve French, and Jeff Baker. And we pray, Father, for the upcoming surgery for Galen Borland, surgery this week. And we pray, Father, for your healing hand to continue to be at work in Marlon Allworth's life. That God would hear their prayers, surround them with circles of skilled and understanding people, 
and answer their deepest needs according to his loving plans for them, let us pray to the Lord. For ourselves, young and old, rich and poor, singles, couples, families, as we gather for worship and care for one another in our spiritual, emotional, and physical needs, that the word of God grow richly among us to the praise of God's holy name, let us pray to the Lord. And Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the birth of a baby girl, Claire, Adeline, uh, Niemerg, a daughter of Bobby and Kristen Kuhnert, Niemerg. We pray, Father, that you be with Claire until she comes to the waters of baptism, whereby you adopt her into your family of grace and forgiveness. We pray that as she grows, that she be a blessing to her parents and they to her, especially as they grow together in your love. Into your hands, Heavenly Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy that you will answer with blessings none of us deserves for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated, and I'd have our children come forward for our children's message today. Morning, boys and girls. How are we doing? Come on, we'll get you in. There's room right there. Come on, boys. I'll sit over here. There you go. They're going to make room for you. Okay? All right. So, how was Sunday school? Good? Did I hear great? Who said great? Good. It was great. I'm happy for you. Now, today we heard that God loves his people to pray. Do you pray? How many of you pray? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Now, what do you pray for? How many of you pray before you eat? Why do you do that? Huh? You pray for your mom's cooking? Huh? You pray to thank God, right? How many of you pray before you go to bed? Okay. How many of you say a prayer like this? Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Okay, good. And then... After that comes, well, God bless me, my mom. No, you don't pray, pray that? Well, maybe you will as you get older. Okay, now, now why, do you, why do you pray? Because you want to talk to God? How many of you talk to God by praying? Okay, how many of you, what would you do if you would not talk to your parents? What would happen? Huh? What happened if you wouldn't talk to your parents? What would happen? Would they be happy? They'd be upset. They'd wonder, what's going on? So you would talk to your parents. Do your parents talk to you? Is that important? Is that important for your parents to talk to you? Yes. Well, God wants us to talk to him just like we talk to our parents. And you know, we can because we are loved by God. 
Let's fold our hands and bow our heads, and I'd like you to pray with me this morning. Dear Jesus, thank you for your wonderful love for me and my family. Be with us today and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. What? Well, that cleaned out my ear. What does the people of God say? Yeah. There you go. Go join your parents. Thanks for coming up. Let us rise for the benediction. Persist in your faith and go with peace, for the Lord your God hears and answers your prayers. before we go uh, today with the greeting of peace our remodeling downstairs is making progress for our preschool we are on target for uh, this year's uh, preschool beginning after Labor Day and uh, it looks like uh, we'll have a dedication service uh, in September for that purpose but probably in a couple of weeks you'll be able to go downstairs and see all the things that have been done to beautify and to make our preschool what it'll be for this year and upcoming years 
that lie ahead. We greet one another with the peace of Christ.